Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us at one of the webinars organized in the framework of our Trapoco, Transnational Political Contention in Europe Network, co-financed by the Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet Action of the European Union. Today, the topic of our conversation is the avenues for environmental struggles in Europe which is one of the main stand of our um, interest uh, during our um, three years project um, involving a number of universities uh, and different type of, type of activities from research to um, uh, public debate like this one. I'm Luisa Chiodi, I am obesity director and I'm very happy to be here with um, uh, important speakers such as Amelie um, Huber, uh, Euronature, Save the Blue Heart of Europe to start with, um, Thomas, Wa Thomas Waits, Member of Parliament of the Greens, um, Jelena Pesic, researcher of the University of Belgrade, a professor at the University of Belgrade, and Lucy Grail, activist and researcher at um, Asud Association. We will be joined later on by um, uh, Lambis Condonis, policy advisor um, in the Western Balkan Working Group of the European Parliament. Um, our interest in the topic has emerged because of the research we carried out, but also because of um, pieces of news that um, brought hope to uh, environmental and climate movement in Europe um, and globally recently. The first is that Albania, um, uh, is, uh, the news com coming from Albania, where the government announced recently the establishment of a national park dedicated to protecting the Viosa River. The Viosa River is one of the Europe last remaining wild river free from dams and dikes. And um, the decision to create this national park uh, results from a decade long transnational mobilization of various organizations and activists led by um, the Save Blue Heart of Europe coalition. Uh, Viosa, the case of Viosa River and the success of this coalition is for us an inspiration and, and somehow an example uh, also in general for climate activists in other countries. And then we have a second news that comes from the United Nations where the General Assembly passed an historical resolution requesting the International Court of Justice to issue an opinion on legal responsibility of, of, of states combating climate change. This resolution was initiated by a law student uh, from a Pacific island threatened by climate change. And although the court's uh, opinion will not be binding uh, on national courts, it has the potential to influence judges at global level and have an impact on international legal systems. So climate activists um, have welcomed this resolution because it broadens precisely this international court of justice mandate uh, to include climate action and it can clarify the legal obligation of governments. Therefore, it provides an additional tool for all of us of civil society to pursue, including legal challenges against government on environmental issues, government and uh, firms as well. Um, while dissidents and protests are increasingly criminalized uh, and repressed across Europe, um, legal activism appears to be one of the remaining uh, avenues for civil society to advance uh, causes. In the Balkans, environmental struggles are not uh, limited to hydroelectric power plants um, uh, for which the Viosa River was saved, but the, um, the evidence of mobilization has been taking place in the last few years in many different fields. Uh, and for the country of the region, mobilization on, envir on environment are also part of a process of European Union integration, with the EU having a role um, which is ambivalent, sometimes even contradictory. So what we want to discuss today is um, the spaces for transnational initiative to grow uh, in the protection of environment. Um, so how um, all of us can join forces transnationally at European level and global level too, to um, protect our environment and, and our future. Our first speaker, I'm very glad to introduce, Amelie Huber, is um, a fresh water project manager at Euronator Foundation in Germany, where she coordinates the Save the Blue Heart of Europe campaign um, that I, I already mentioned as an initiative that um, worked to uh, uh, halt the construction of destructive hydropower um, in station in the Western Balkans. 
Uh, but before that, she spent even several years researching on hydropower conflict in Eastern Himalaya region of India. And she holds a PhD in political ecology from the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology in Barcelona. So, um, Amelie, uh, oh, Amelie um, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Luisa. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, if there's anything irregular, please let me know. <laughs> um, so um, thanks a lot for inviting me to this really inspiring uh, webinar. I'm very excited to be here. And I'm honored to be able to present uh, the Save the Blue Heart of Europe campaign that has now been running for over 10 years. And um, yeah, there's uh, been many people involved with it. I myself have only been involved for the last three years. Sorry, there's things making noises in the background. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I hope I live up to the challenge of presenting this in 15 minutes, so I go right into it. Um, what I've been asked to present today is um, the, the, the trajectory of the campaign, how it came about, um, but um, uh, more particularly the alliances that we formed and that made this, let's say, let's call it a successful campaign, even though it's still running, and we hope to have many more successes uh, in the future. Um, and also the transnational dimension of uh, of this of the campaign and the alliances we formed, and then I'll also go a, a little bit into I've given I'll give an update on the Vyasa uh, National Park uh, that's been declared recently, and um, the next steps uh, for for Vyasa. So um, when um, the the idea for the campaign started around 2011-2012, when uh, the global hydropower boom that uh, that actually started around the turn of the millennium, millennium was in full swing already. And um, even though in Europe, most rivers have been very heavily exploited for hydropower and other, um, yeah, other constructions, um, the Balkan region was one of the, let's say, target areas of, of hydro, hydropower investors. And so, um, we didn't know very much about uh, the, the entire situation at the time. So the first thing that uh, Riverwatch and Oil Natur did was to commission a study uh, that was basically a, a hydromorphological assessment of the entire Balkan region. Um, because, I mean, uh, we knew at the time that this was a very, from an ecological point of view, a very pristine area and especially concerning the rivers. So um, that study assessed about 35,000 river kilometers and found that 30% um, of those were in a near natural state and 80% uh, in an only slightly modified uh, state. And to put this into perspective, um, we have here in the map also the situation in Germany. The blue is the best and the red is the worst, uh, I think in five categories. And so uh, if we look at Germany, this is what uh, 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 the largest part of Europe looks like because rivers have been severely modified. Um, and so this is also why we call the Balkans the blue heart of Europe um, because the rivers there are still in a very pristine state overall. Um, I'm just gonna sh run you very, very quickly through a few pictures so that you also enjoy the beauty of uh, the landscapes and the rivers, riverine landscapes uh, in the Balkans. This is the Vyosa, famous picture. <laughs> and so um, we then also commissioned a study on, uh, on fish and other um, biodiver uh, freshwater biodiversity fish populations, uh, and um, yeah, we, we were um, actually very excited to find that there's like 113 um, endangered species uh, in the Balkans, um, 87, I can't see the number right now, but it's, um, sorry, it's in the top there, uh, sorry, 69 of them are endemic species, um, and so actually um, you can consider this a, a biodiversity hotspot. 
And so in 2013, um, together with uh, partner organizations from different Balkan countries that I'll go on to introduce, we uh, launched the Save the Blue Heart of Europe campaign with the idea not to just save one river, but to save them all. <laughs> and uh, obviously we were set up for a very long, um, for a very long fight that is nowhere near finished. Um, here you have the extent of, of hydropower plants that were planned. I think these numbers are from 2020 uh, and they have been, the, the red ones are the planned and the black ones are the existing hydropower uh, projects. Uh, and you can see on this graph that they have been increasing over time. I think in, in recent years there has been a slight decrease again in numbers. Um, and a lot of these are these, what we see here in the picture, these small hydropower projects, and uh, there's lots of them. So um, that was like one of the challenges we, we try to tackle is to how to make sure that these small hydropower projects are not built because um, the impact of one might not be as, as large as that of a big one, but then if you put them into these huge cascades, it's a tremendous ecological impact. Uh, and not only, of course, there's the social uh, consequences um, of building dams on rivers that mean a lot to local populations. So uh, the main goals we had with this campaign was, uh, first of all, to raise public awareness about the, the value of the Balkan rivers and the threats to them, um, to stop dams in, firstly, four key areas. Um, the, initially, we, we wanted to especially save uh, Vyosa, Mavrovo National Park in North Macedonia, the Sava River uh, that runs through several countries, and the rivers of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, nowadays, we are uh, in, involved in a lot more uh, rivers in the region. Um, then we also wanted to propose a, a master plan with no-go areas for dams, so, uh, for uh, decision makers and policy makers and uh, to overall improve the knowledge about biodiversity in, in the Balkan rivers. And these are the organizations that we are um, mostly uh, working with. There have been others in the past, so this is not a comprehensive list, but currently these are the partners that we're working with uh, in countries from Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, Serbia, Kosovo, we don't have a partner here, but we are working there as well, um, and uh, North, North Macedonia, Albania, and Greece. And we've also recently started collaborating with uh, an NGO in Montenegro. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Blue Heart campaign is actually a huge bundle of, of different, uh, let's say, smaller campaigns or um, activities or initiatives. And so we, we made this uh, very nice graphic to show <laughs> what we're actually doing. Um, <clears throat> first of all, of course, uh, activists who uh, fight for rivers locally and nationally are uh, the, the biggest, let's say, pillar of our campaign. And without them, we wouldn't be doing all these activities by ourselves. So um, uh, there's the work with local communities uh, there's um, the support of, of protest actions, um, and some of them are very uh, fierce and unsuccessful, like, like blockages of construction sites. Um, and of course, we partner with, uh, with environmental NGOs, like the ones I've, I've shown. And then um, we also, like, let's say one of the alliances that was very successful in this campaign was the alliance with uh, the sports community, especially the the Kai activists, <laughs> uh, and um, there was a very um, yeah, inspiring um, tour that uh, we organized with a group called Leeway Collective from um, Slovenia uh, through uh, kayaking all the Balkan rivers and raising awareness um, at the same time. And, um, and this was also a very nice way of connecting struggles in different countries to one another. And this, this was a protest of, of that group in, or of all of us actually, in uh, Tirana. Um, then uh, science has also been a, a really important ally for us. Uh, of course, we, um, we commissioned studies uh, in the very beginning and we continue to work a lot with uh, scientific research to, as I already said, to improve the knowledge of, of biodiversity and other aspects of these rivers. 
Um, but uh, we also uh, figured out that we needed to, um, yeah, to try and get as much data on these rivers as fast as possible because they this data can then again be used in legal fights. So um, there have been several science camps or, or research weeks that we organized in Albania and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this was this has been a very su successful activity also from a communications point of view because you can it, it makes for very nice photos and this, the journalists that were present in those research weeks could then communicate to the outside world. Um, and then the scientist support was also important, for example, in the campaign for Viosa um, at the time of the, when we had to, uh, when we had to legally challenge the EIA, uh, also like a, a huge number, 700, over 700 scientists signing a petition uh, that was a, a very strong statement. Uh, and uh, recently we launched a scientist for Balkan Rivers Network to um, yeah, in increase uh, scientific research initiatives in the Balkans. And then uh, that, that has been another uh, important pillar of our, of our work uh, to, to basically legally challenge uh, hydropower projects. And we started doing that in 2015. Um, the, the very first uh, complaints, if I remember well, were against uh, the Mokritze hydropower plant in Slovenia, um, against uh, ma um, hydropower plants in Mavrovo National Park in North Macedonia, and also very importantly, the the Pochem um, compl complaint against the Pochem hydropower plant on Viosa, which I think was one of the very first environmental uh, complaints in Albania at the time, uh, and which was successful. And uh, we, ma we managed to legally challenge two hydropower plants on, um, on, uh, on Viosa. And that I think also was a very important contributor to the success of the, of the Viosa campaign. And we uh, work with uh, legal teams in every country that we work in. Um, and that is, that is proving a very successful, um, or very promising, let's say, collaboration between NGOs and, and legal teams. Um, in Bosnia, for example, they even managed to change legislation through their work. So um, we, we also see the, the legal activism as, as a very promising tool for us. Of course, uh, there's also policy work happening, um, especially the um, challenging of, of the financing of hydropower dams. Um, also, we've recently, um, we recently did a campaign on the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, these partly operate on, on EU level, but then also on national level. Um, there's been different initiatives. One very successful one was partnering with Patagonia um, to collect signatures to uh, basically lobby the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. And um, we managed to submit over 100,000 signatures to the European Bank, to the EBRD. And then subsequ subsequently, they also um, refrained from, from financing further large, uh, further projects in the Balkans. And yeah, I mean, I've, I'm going to be talking about Patagonia again later, but um, that's also another important, let's say, alliance that was formed in the very beginning already of the campaign. Um, they have been providing small grants initially to us, but then also uh, communication support uh, because of their big outreach, of course. And um, yeah, and then on, up to the public private partnership uh, for Viosa National Park that I will talk about in the end. And then also a very important um, aspect of this campaign was to team up with artists um, just because of the different kind of um, reach they have to the public. Um, it also operates more on an emotional level. And um, I think in the Balkans this worked very well to um, basically work with artists to raise the message about the threat to Balkan rivers and the need to protect them. This was a big concert we, we had in, in sorry, Serbia or Sarajevo, I don't remember exactly, in 2008. No, sorry, this was a Vyasa concert. And then here's another one in Sarajevo, if I'm not mistaken, 2018. So these, uh, this, these were 
um, celebrities uh, and that raised a lot of attention in the public. And then uh, even during COVID, uh, artists wanted to support the campaign. And so we collected all these uh, musical postcards and tributes, testimonies um, on the website, um, showing the support of various types of artists for the campaign. And then finally, I think, um, especially when, when we look at Vyosa, um, yeah, working through media uh, was really important. Um, and again, this is also where, this, where we see how important, let's say, international attention to the threats in these, uh, you know, very, let's say, remote in our imaginary countries that are remote in our imaginary <laughs> Uh, where this attend international attention really helped to raise pressure on on national um, decision makers, um, especially in the case of Yasa, we we were lucky to be able to partner with many big news outlets, not partner but have our story um, featured there. Um, we also found that. Um, for example, for um, activists suffering from slap cases, which is something that is um, increasing nowadays in also among the, high, let's say, river, river protector community, um, that raising international awareness and uh, putting media attention to these cases has helped um, these activists, or let's say has moved the, the complainants, uh, often companies, um, to back, to back away, to uh, recede from the complaints. And then, of course, um, <laughs> the main mascot for the Blue Heart campaign uh, has been uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and his um, uh, social media activity on Vyosa, but also on, on um, the fights in, in Bosnia, has really, um, really raised to help to raise pressure, um, let's say, in Albania. For example, so um, that was for sure an important, um, yeah, influence influence from, let's say, internationally, and then maybe also to to show some other actions that we had where this uh, where these transnational alliances uh, were really important. One was the Vyasa National Park Now campaign, where we managed to have these uh, letters laid out in various parts of the world, um, and then. We collected this, and it was it also made for for some good media stories. Um, and um, yeah, a, a, another thing I should mention is that uh, from the very beginning, I think in 2015, um, we tried to to create a community um, of let's say river protect protectors, NGOs, activists um, from across the Balkans. Initially, this was a Balkan uh, meeting. But then uh, we we also held various European river summits, and this really helped to create a, a stronger community, help people to exchange with other activists, um, gain confidence, and 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 various other benefits that came from this. So um, yeah, um, probably I'm I'm not sure if everybody has heard about this, but one of our biggest fights has now really. Um, uh, found a very positive, uh, let's say, turn. The uh, Vyasa was finally de declared a national park by the, the government of Albania. Um, this hasn't come from today, uh, from, you know, from this hasn't happened just yesterday, <laughs> but it's been uh, the declaration of the national park was announced maybe a year or more ago. Um, and uh, Patagonia, the, the clothing company, was a really important, uh, let's say, ally in, in this, mostly also for the Albanian government, because they um, promised to help financially to um, implement this uh, national park. Um, and it's a mammoth task. So, of course, um, a lot ha has happened over the last year um, in terms of discussions, what kind of park uh, would it be? What are the what is the extension of the park? What is the protection category? National park is, I think, the uh, oof, don't, not quite sure it's category four. <laughs> um, 
but um, yeah, it's a very good protection category. Initially, they wanted to also only declare a nature park. Um, and so now we are in uh, at, the, at, at the second stage, I think, of the implement, implementation of the park. So um, a management board and a management plan needs to, need to be set up um, that, in, that, that involves a lot of uh, international experts and decision makers. Um, mostly it's a, it's a task that is led by the Albanian government, but then with the support of um, Patagonia and NGOs and, and also um, local civil society. Um, and they have, okay. they're estimating that, do I still have time? Very little. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're estimating that uh, the park might be uh, implemented by um, 2024. Um, I mean, that this first stage, that this stage will be completed by 2024. Um, and they will be able, will be constructing first facilities, information centers, et cetera, by then. And uh, the role uh, that civil society has uh, in this at the moment, um, it's really very much that watchdog function. So it's not like we pushed for this and now we're not there anymore, but we very much um, accompany the process, ensure that there's proper mon monitoring, um, that data collection happens, and that there's also other problems that aren't ignored. Uh, that the river still um, is uh, is that the challenges there that are still there for the proper environmental protection of the river, uh, like sediment extraction, the drilling oil drilling stations that are still there, some dam projects that are still on the tributaries and need to be um, legally challenged and removed. So that it's like procedure, and then also the the construction of the airport in the delta of the Viosa. <laughs> Which, um, which is a fight that, that is still being fought. So um, the National Park was declared, but now they want to still go ahead with constructing a, an airport in the Viosa Delta. So I think I'll stop here, and then if there are any questions now or later, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry if I took more time, I didn't check. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, I, I'm I sure I have many questions uh, uh, later on, but I think we should kind of follow the order, although we will have some uh, changes in, 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 uh, <laughs> in the meantime as well. But um, let me first anyway um, uh, give the floor to Thomas Waits, that is, as I mentioned, a member of the European Parliament for the Austrian Greens and uh, who is also a co-chair of the European Green Party. Uh, with his political work, um, he focused on environmental issues, sustainable agriculture, uh, and strong and foreign uh, peace policy. And he's particularly active on new accession and the relation with the Western Balkan countries. So in addition to that, uh, Thomas is also an organic farmer, forester and beekeeper. Um, so who could be um, better um, <laughs> uh, discussing with us um, this uh, large topic of uh, transnational mobilization for the blue heart of Europe and whether this positive example that we will then rediscuss again with Amelie um, can be replicated or what really made the big difference in this case that cannot be done in other situations. Please, um, uh, um, Thomas, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you, Luisa, for your very kind, uh, uh, welcoming words here and, and uh, hi to everyone who is listening to this webinar here today. And I, I, I hope and I guess I was invited to this conversation also because me personally being very active on the Blue Heart of Europe campaign, but specifically on the Viosa case um, for, for many years now. Uh, let, let me start with first a bit of a political overview on the meta level. Uh, we're, we're having from, from the European Parliament side, uh, we're, we're supporting the accession processes with the so-called SAPC missions where parliamentarians from the European Union uh, meet with parliamentarians from the local national parliaments uh, and, and are supporting and contributing to the accession process, to the negotiation process. And, um, and, and so this, is, this, this river topic is one that is a cross-cutting topic over the whole region, as you've described already, the sheer amount of close to 4,000 plant uh, hydropower plants in the region. And it's uh, the, the problematics uh, are quite comparable in the region, but also uh, the strategies of resistance are quite comparable and also well-organized altogether. 
What we face in these negotiations is a situation where a lot of the countries, not Albania, but a lot of the other countries like Kosovo, like uh, North Macedonia, as an example, but also Serbia uh, or, or Bosnia, are still heavily relating on coal-fired power plants um, to provide their energy supply to the population and, and uh, are also facing heavy pollution problems um, and, and there's a strong push from the European Union and also quite some finances to overcome this, this um, old style of, of energy production, especially in this kind of very old 70s style uh, coal-fired power plants. And then uh, coming with, with uh, let's say, critical views on hydropower uh, is creating quite some need for discussion um, with the local policymakers, because uh, they're they're coming back to us and saying, okay, guys, I mean, okay, we understand coal is last century and we got to get rid of it because of climate and because of also meeting climate goals uh, towards EU accession uh, and also pollution and all, all the impact that has now health of, of citizens. And now you come and tell us, but hydro, hydropower is also not what you should do. So what do you actually want us to do now? Uh, somewhere we have to get this electricity from. So this is very much where the discussion uh, is happening. And there, one, one, one argument is very crucial, and this is the argument of uh, damage and result balance. Um, I mean, every, every production of, of energy uh, is having natural costs. Uh, whether you put a windmill somewhere in the landscape, they, you have to pay, you have to build a, a roads, you, you have to put concrete into soil, you, you pay an environmental cost, same comes from solar and the same is uh, especially for hydropower plant, plants and, and there uh, what was very important is to raise the awareness that hydropower is not hydropower you have some rivers which are already blocked by existing dams uh, and you have some rivers and on the Balkan areas a lot of rivers which still have an extremely high biodiversity uh, an extremely high ecological value where where the amount of electricity you would get from a, especially small a hydropower plant is is just by far not balancing or not even somehow creating the imagination of balancing uh, the eco the ecological price you're paying for it. So to to it, it took quite a lot of discussions to differentiate uh, also uh, um, uh, this this point of view on hydropower. Me personally, I'm critical about nearly every hydropower, but uh, I'm the green guy here in this club, and and uh, if I'm talking about European Parliament as such. Uh, uh, it was uh, it, we at least managed to create some awareness uh, that that uh, a lot of these, especially small uh, hydropower plants, are clearly uh, to be rejected. The same, uh, um, let's say, awareness building was needed uh, towards European Investment Bank, which is uh, one that is directly uh, an EU institution, so um, a, a bank that we have direct influence on, a bit less on EPRD. I mean, they were also listening to us, but it's not directly under our institution to also create this awareness, uh, uh, not to finance um, um, hydropower um, as, as little as possible, but really look very, very close uh, to the ecological damage that this is this is giving. Uh, that let me also mention uh, a second point. I mean, we have uh, all the uh, negotiations around the environment in Chapter Twenty Seven, so in the accession talks. Uh, but the actual crucial negotiations are on Chapter 23 and 24, because what we see in the region is that all the environmental damages and also the ones uh, related to hydropower are very much related to the question of rule of law. So who is getting the permission? How did people actually get this permission? Um, uh, yeah, who who is is this? Ah, this is the family of the president. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Like you, you see the lack of 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 um, transparent and uh, a, a rule of law based procedures when it comes to permissions. Um, and so whenever you want to want to look into environmental protection, you have to look into rule of law first. And so putting a lot of pressure on the countries uh, to also take the, the court cases uh, that have been initiated, sometimes by international communities, sometimes by local activists, sometimes even by local population, uh, to we, we, we spent uh, or we, we, yeah, we put a lot of attention on this, um, mentioning these court cases explicitly in our talks uh, as kind of, let's say, um, 
well as 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 possibility for these countries to prove that they're on a good way when it comes to rule of law, so independence of justice, transparency procedures, and so on. And like this, we I think we were able to help uh, uh, to well support the willingness of some governments to ensure that this is a fair fair procedures. Uh, and, and proper legal cases, and that they are dealt with in a proper way. And the same comes for slap suits um, when it comes uh, uh, towards suits, uh, so so court cases against environmental protectors. Uh, this immediately leads me to to another strain of, of of my work, and this is very much related to Austrian companies in the region uh, being very very much invested into hydropower uh, investments. Um, uh, you, you have this one picture, um, Amelie, uh, of, of uh, um, I think it was, um, um, what was her name? I, I don't have it in the moment now, but it was this Kelkos case. And Kelkos is a, a sub-company of, of an Austrian company called Ellag. Uh, and uh, uh, we were able to mediate in this case. We were able to put enough pressure on this Austrian company to drop the court case. Um, because what I basically did is I was attacking them in Austria because they're painting themselves as very green company and I was able to prove that they may be green in Austria but they're really not green anyhow uh, when they leave Austria they use the also legal uncertainties let's call it like this uh, to make their profitable business uh, with with the environment paying a high price um, so so uh, this a bit uh, as a bigger overview, uh, and then it comes to more bit details. And this was uh, the the try to at least influence uh, the regulations around IPA three funds. This is uh, for fourteen point seven billion euros that are allocated for the accession countries. Uh, so to to um, um, have an influence on the criteria, what projects can be financed and what not, uh, and there. Uh, uh, in inserting also a certain environmental consciousness um, um, in, in the question of, well, balance of, of economical revenues and ecological price to pay when it comes to hydropower. It, well, we just partially succeeded, uh, but at least um, uh, partially that there was some, some better rules set up um, uh, for the current IPA3 funds. Um, and then let me come uh, to, to the Viosa story as such. Um, uh, I mean, this, this, I, I was just, and, and we in the European Parliament were just playing, like, let's say, one role of many roles in this, in this really big adventure to, to make this national park happen. Um, and so what, what, we, what we did was twofold. First of all, uh, joining the efforts on, on creating public attention for that. Uh, so, uh, well, personally and, and many of us supporting the activities uh, where you've seen the photos also uh, with with the with the big uh, sheets that we were put, we were putting up and and, and having having the the save viosa um, slogan across the globe but also we, we were we were having um, events within the European Parliament also inviting the Commission uh, and raising awareness within the Commission what what uh, ecological um, uh, treasure uh, there is still to be seen but the main work was on, on the Albanian government. And, and there, um, you know, we're, we're drafting reports on the country every year, uh, which, which I'm co-responsible for, at least for the green side. Um, and we're having the regular meetings with our colleagues from the parliament, uh, Albanian parliament, but also with the government. Uh, and what we managed is to include Viosa into every single report uh, of all these years again and again and again what we managed is to bring it up in the conversations again and again and again in the final documents that we're having with with the colleagues from albania always having it mentioned always putting pressure and i mean we made it a bit of a of a let's say of a test also for the albanian government we also told them we said look i mean you you, you want to tell us you you you, you want to show ambition when it comes to chapter 27 let 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 uh, I mean, make us believe, you know, make us believe. Yeah? We, we, we really want to see. I mean, this is the case, you know, uh, um, uh, this is the case on which, on which we will uh, we will judge you in a way, yeah? whether you mean it serious or whether you're just telling us some nice stories when we're visiting you. So, so it, uh, and then, I mean, the conversations, Eddie Rama was not all too happy about that, I must tell you. Um, but but uh, we were able to convince them with several arguments. First of all, okay, 
there was a certain momentum where they said, okay, let's give it to these Europeans, you know, if they think that's what they want. Uh, 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 yeah, we want accession and we want their, their budgets and we want the finances and we need that. And if they want this environmental red borium, let, let them have it. Yeah. Uh, but then he, they came up first with uh, the national, uh, not national park, a nature park, which was not proper, uh, proper, um, um uh protection status but actually the gov the, the government not so much the prime minister but the government uh, uh we were able at the parliamentarians we were able also to convince with another argument and this was the international perception of albania and the future of albanians uh, albania's tourism which uh, is already very much developing in a close to nature tourism uh which where, where they see in numbers what potential that has and they know that their biggest obstacle in developing also, uh, let's say, mild forms of, of, of uh, uh, nature tourism, the biggest obstacles they have in the, in the international context is the very bad uh, reputation nice. the country has. Uh, and, and what was really where we, where we were able to convince them was like saying, look, guys, see, I mean, Albania is in the media of of the whole world, you know. You, suddenly, people here from Albania they never knew where that country actually is, and that this is existing. This is the best promotion your country ever had, the best touristic promotion your country ever had. Suddenly, people in the whole world realize what a fantastic natural heritage you have to visit. And overall, this is also changing the narrative about your country. Your country is not anymore, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, how to say um, well uh, seen as a as a as a country of, of organized crime and, and drug trafficking and whatever but your country is suddenly seen as a very favorable touristic destination for nature that you may not find in other regions of the world anymore and this is the best promotion for your country you ever had so now just imagine you're not fulfilling the hopes of all these people you're not fulfilling you have all these thousands of journalists globally that have been writing about fantastic Viosa, and now imagine you put the dam there what a bad reputation that would fire back to you and cost you a lot on tourism and at the end of the day uh, you, your country earns more with uh, mild forms of nature tourism than with a sim sim simple dam built by a Turkish company uh, and, and so this kind of economical arguments were very strong what did I forget yes one thing I forgot what I wanted to mention and this was very key was the cooperation with local population so not just with local civil society but really with local population so farmers you know uh, villages people living next to the rivers uh, uh, people that that run herds that need these rivers to to, to water their animals uh, like all of all of these communities they were extremely important also for us in the political work because we could see this is not just an let's say elaborated pro project of some elite uh, civil society organizations of the European Union uh, but but this is also super important for the local population that do not want to, to, to uh, lose the access to their river and the right to use the river uh, for, 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 for their daily life. And that would be displaced because their villages would be flooded and all of this. And like really link it down to local population. That was one of the main instruments that also helped us to contribute uh, to, 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 this, uh, to this, I would say, very positive outcome when it comes to Viosa. Last but not least, where we're still having an, an open fight is, uh, and it was mentioned already, was the Florida airport. Uh, I mean, there is a, a rather big old military airport in the middle of this of this protected area already. Um, uh, and and uh, but still, the plans show that this area should be extended. So um, uh, that additional parts of the of the delta of the highly protected delta uh, should be used uh, for enlarging this Florida airport, and uh, you will see again once again. I mean, we, I think we will vote it this week. Uh, you will once again see criticism on this uh, in the report, uh, and we will be in Albania again on the SAPC mission uh, on the 17, 16, and seventeen July, um, and again there we will put as much pressure as possible to limit the negative impact of this construction of an airport in Vlore. We advocate better build a good train line to Tirana uh, that would uh, uh, actually reduce the need to have an additional airport in Vlore.
Uh, but this is just a detail at the side. So the the the, the fight on, on the Viosa is not totally over, but I mean the fight on so many more precious rivers in the regions uh, are still ongoing. So yes, it's a fantastic result on Viosa, but we still need to keep the pressure up. Uh, there's so much more to save. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned so many central issues um, in your presentation. Presentation and also, um, I mean, I would have immediately question to ask, but I cannot do that because one of our speaker, um, uh, there should be a discussion, uh, is traveling and only has a tiny slot for us. Uh, so I ask forgiveness also for the other two um, speakers and give first of all the floors to um, uh, Lambus Condonis, who um, will leave us uh, shortly, um, because he has been a political advisor in the European Parliament for the left. Uh, since October 2014, um, and, and he was also um, ad, um, acting Deputy Secretary General in, in his political group in 2017. And in general, he has an extent, extensive 25 years experience working in the European institution, international organization, governments and civil society, and himself as well as all our our speakers have um, a close knowledge of um, uh, the, the experience of the Viosa Rifa. So, um, uh, um, Condonis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Luisa. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and organizing this very important uh, uh, webinar. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate uh, the work of all the colleagues that they have worked so many years on these very important uh, issues uh, with dedication and also Thomas, uh, that, uh, the work that he has done uh, in the parliament. Uh, perhaps he remembers that uh, he participated in a conference in March 2019 that we organized uh, uh, with the participation actually of four political groups and many, many of the NGOs, uh, either international or local, uh, were active uh, on this matter, the hydroelectric power plants that uh, really creates uh, uh, so many problems and needs uh, more elaboration and uh, to think carefully how uh, this project can go ahead. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, on this. Uh, I'm a, a career diplomat. I was working in the Commission in the past and in the Parliament now on, uh, on Western Balkans. Uh, so I became very sensitive on this, traveling in the Balkans and speaking with the local communities. Thomas mentioned this uh, at the end, uh, uh, but uh, this is really one of the big factors that uh, uh, we have to uh, be close to them uh, because it are the people that they really suffer uh, because of, uh, of all these projects. And today, of course, uh, it looks that there are important, uh, important improvements uh, regarding the rivers in uh, in Western Balkans, but uh, and also it's a big achievement what happened in Viosa. Uh, the issue is uh, that what, what is happening with other cases, because uh, I, I remember uh, we used to say in 2019 that there are 2,100 hydroelectric power plants, and today we speak about 3,500. So uh, although there are big successes and there is visibility on these successes, like Viosa, uh, very rightly, uh, uh, our colleague mentioned uh, before the Mavrovo in North Macedonia and uh, the other uh, big projects. Uh, but one of the challenges from our side is not to forget the other cases. Uh, it was mentioned before that uh, we fight and really we fight hard. Uh, I remember when I was the commission, we tried to put in the, in the commission report these issues in the annual report and now in the parliament report. And now in the parliament report, uh, there is a mentioning of Yosa, and we congratulate the, the Albanian government for Yosa. Uh, but what, uh, what about Valbona a National Park? What about the other cases that uh, we, we uh, tend to put it in, uh, not, not forget, but uh, we have to continue working on that and put pressure uh, to the to, to the governments in the region, uh, because we are not speaking about the permanent damage that these hydroelectric power uh, power plants uh, causes, uh, but also is the other dimensions that uh, some of them were already mentioned uh, is 
environmental issues connecting with the damage caused, but also the environmental institutions in, this, in these countries, the environmental inspectors, do they really exist? Are they really there? Uh, what about the environmental assessments that all these uh, uh, companies or governmental departments produce before any real uh, any uh, construction? Are they up to the international standards? Uh, what about the access to, to water, the water supply for the local communities? Uh, do we have uh, a combine all this project with uh, a, a, a more holistic approach on sustainable development and tourism? Because these small areas, these are the areas in Viosa, the areas in other uh, places in Bosnia or uh, North Macedonia, uh, they have started developing uh, tourism. They have started developing uh, uh, some good or bad ways of development. And uh, the hydroelectric power plants, in some cases, are disastrous for local communities that they try to develop a sustainable tourism or sustainable development model. Uh, for, for me, really, uh, is central you know, on this subject, the issue of corruption, the issues of independence of judiciary, the rule of law, because it started uh, with this kind of phenomena when thousands of hydroelectric power plants started in Western Balkans were not because of their needs. Because if you go now in some areas, you can see streams, streams, not rivers, streams, and to have their uh, hydroelectric power plants to, <laughs> to, to be built. So uh, in parallel, because you cannot solve all the problems of, uh, of, of these countries in one day, as you very well know better than me, uh, the issues of rule of law, the issue of judiciary, the court cases that uh, was mentioned before, and what difficulties the local communities, and representatives of the local communities, and the representatives of, of the local NGOs are facing, uh, and the events that, that they face in some cases from, uh, from the state uh, using the, the judiciary, uh, it is really very hard to describe. Uh, of course, the lack of any consultation with the local community, any dialogue with the local communities before the authorization and the development of these projects uh, is really shocking because we have cases that villages, they learn from TV that they have, uh, that, that hydroelectric power plants will be built in the region. So uh, it's also another issue uh, that uh, we have to see properly. Uh, in general, of course, uh, uh, this I mentioned the assessment before. I mean, the, I mean, we have to see very carefully uh, the. I mean, to be careful to see how how we generate electricity. That in in this case there is a proportionality between the the electricity that, that they they produce and the investment and the, the possible damage that they cause. So also there is an issue of economics and development. Uh, so there are many questions that uh, we can pose on these uh, projects. Uh, and of course, we have to celebrate what was achieved in the Osa National Park, but we have to remain vigilant and uh, active uh, in, in all these cases, that uh, all the other thousands of cases that uh, we have in Western Balkans. Um, so, for, for me, working all these years on these subjects, uh, I mean, there is uh, some lessons learned. Uh, I mean, this, uh, uh, the, the extremely positive results of the close uh, transnational coordinated actions uh, and uh, political work uh, by the NGOs, by the activists, by the scientists, the local communities, but also of the politicians. And it was mentioned before, uh, the importance of the, uh, all these fora, like the interparliamentary uh, uh, group between the European Parliament and the, the Albanian Parliament. Uh, and also the, the pressure that we have to put uh, uh, to the governments in the region uh, and using the tool of the accession process, 
because since there will be member states, things are getting perhaps a little bit more uh, le le less clear, to put it mildly, and also to inform all these international institutions, like the EBRD was mentioned before, uh, of the real damage, because there were cases that projects were, were, were um, approved uh, without really uh, properly checked uh, uh, or monitored by international organizations that actually are proud uh, about, about these projects. So, uh, so I will stop there. There are other uh, colleagues in this on this panel that uh, they are more expert on me, but uh, it's important not to forget uh, all the other cases uh, that exist in Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lambis. I I do um, really appreciate your emphasis on how potentially the enlargement process could, generally speaking, be central for all other cases beyond this one successful uh, one that we um, are discussing. Um, but before I ask my questions, uh, the, the floor is for Jelena Pesic, who is assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at the Faculty of Philosophy of the University of Belgrade with whom we work at the Trapoco Network and who carried out a lot of research in this specific field of um, transnational um, mobilization in the environmental field. She's interested in theoretical foundation of collective action and social movement. And she has been involved in two uh, research projects specifically uh, on recent civic protests in Serbia. Um, Jelena, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Louise, and thank you all for your presentations, because a lot of things that I wanted to say you have already said. Uh, so my name is Jelena Pesic, and I'm working within the Strapako project uh, uh, together with uh, my two other colleagues. And just briefly, let me say that we have done uh, already three studies. One is uh, already published, two are in the process of publishing, and we have been uh, dealing with uh, discursive framing of grassroots environmental initiatives in Serbia, uh, and uh, uh, their uh, elements of transnationalization. So uh, let me uh, start with this uh, uh, constatation that in recent years, we are witnessing the rise of environmental activism in Western Balkans. And that is something which is kind of peculiar because it is not the region which was previously known for these kind of initiatives. And much of these initiatives are actually related to the advent of grassroots movement and uh, gra organized actions of uh, uh, people who are coming from rural, rural areas, who are resource deprived, uh, and who were previously not very politically active. So the rise of these initiatives uh, was related to the consequences which were brought about, uh, brought about, brought about the process of uh, economic transformation of the region, and that came after the post-socialist uh, transformation transition, and a long period of declining economic activity. So we have now economic growth or the, the imposition of economic growth and the raising living standard, which is sometimes, uh, 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 which is leading to uh, the need for new industrial investments, but also to the uh, greater consumption of electricity and energy. And it poses new challenges to the region. So this inflow of foreign capital in situation of poor and selective implementation of environmental standards sometimes is ending up in serious degradation of environment, such as, for example, in the case of Serbia, uh, the cases of Hestil or Zijin, which are uh, factories operated by Chinese investors. So initially, these grassroots environmental movements were related to urban middle classes, uh, and their discontent with declining standard of living in uh, the urban areas to, due to uh, air pollution or due to water pollution or uh, industrial hazards. But in recent years, we are seeing uh, that new challenges are emerging and these new challenges are related to the uh, investments in exploitation of natural resources. And uh, of course, uh, now we are seeing some, some other kind of activism, of course, also grassroots activism, but uh, uh, not only not uh, uh, anymore the activism of ur urban middle classes, but the activism of uh, people who are coming, as I said, from rural areas, who were previously very politically passive. They had no experience, no no education, no connections, no media contacts. No, they're not digitally active. They had no really uh, resources, but still they they managed not only to uh, to put up their claims at the local level, but to scale up their discontent at national and even transnational level, as you can see. 
So uh, we can, we put it under the, uh, the the term of environmentalism of the poor or environmentalism of dispossessed, but of course other terms could also uh, apply. Uh, so what is happening that many of these initiatives by connecting with the uh, with local or international organizations, political parties and political groups and movements are managing to scale up uh, and to become uh, not not only local uh, local forms of discontent, but also national forms of discontent. And two most successful initiatives in Serbia were uh, uh, protests against small hydropower plants and later protests against uh, planned lithium exploitation of the company Rio Tinto. Uh, but of course, we can uh, later talk about it, whether it was success and what is success in, this, in, this, uh, in these cases. So what I wanted to say, uh, I have a longer and shorter presentation, maybe due to the time I will stick to the shorter presentation. I'll put my focus on the uh, uh, role of the European Union and the EU accession process to the rise of environmental movements. And as Louisa said, these uh, effects are contradictory to some extent, and I will try to explain why. So European uh, Union and the accession process has many positive, uh, actually uh, had, had brought about many positive incentives to the rise of Euro environmental movement in Serbia and the region. Uh, do, uh, before 2000, year 2000, we actually didn't have any, almost any environmental initiatives in the region. So uh, these positive aspects are related to the EU conditionality regarding the harmonization of uh, national environmental laws, uh, and regulations with the EU standards, and also with harmonization of and implementation of EU policies concerning the environmental protection, such as uh, uh, energy transition policy. And that is something which is actually uh, uh, bringing the, uh, the legislation up to the standards which are uh, uh, which are uh, uh, all over the European Union accepted. Uh, another stimulation is coming from the, uh, uh, from the funds, uh, because, uh, or, as I said, uh, uh, EU funds, EU uh, uh, help, which came uh, in raising capacities, uh, uh, in providing material resources, in uh, uh, giving technical education, a lot of support uh, is crucial for building environmental civil society. As I said uh, before 2000, we didn't actually have uh, really environmental civil society in Serbia. And finally, the EU also fostered the uh, building partnership between uh, civil society organizations and the state, and they promoted the establishment of participatory environmental governance. And uh, what was the effect was not only that civil society has been built, but also that uh, uh, environmental public sphere has been uh, 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 established. Uh, uh, environmental issues started to, to, to enter, to, to penetrate the, the public sphere, and to, uh, environmental issues started to be important issue in political struggles. As I said, these uh, uh, consequences were uh, some. Some of these intentions were really positive, but some, some of the consequences were not such, such positive, and not, they were not really in intended. Uh, and uh, uh, they had some kind of ne negative effects. And I will mention some of these negative effects, which stem from the EU conditionality. Uh, as I said, we have a very good uh, environmental laws, but uh, their implementation uh, is only selective. We have porous implementation of environmental laws, and that is something which uh, is happening when you don't have really control mechanisms which are put in place. And a lot of this is a lot of, of these things are, are actually related to the lack of trans, uh, transparency and accountability, corrupt practices of the government, local governments, and so on. Uh, also, the implementation of the EU supported green policies, such as the energy transition, in situation of such porous implementation of environmental standards is uh, bringing to life these contradictory effects of, uh, of these policies, such as, for example, the construction of hydropower plants, which is producing green energy, but also it destroys biodiversity of the and life of local communities. And in this way, this implementation of green policies can, in the context of the lack of transparency and lack of rule of law, uh, to lead to irreparable consequences to the environment. Uh, also, selective support of the EU donors towards professional NGOs uh, led to creation of a symmetrical structure within environmental movement uh, in which uh, grassroots movement organizations were not really uh, supported enough. And as a result, there is distrust which developed within, be, between those two streams of environmental movement, grassroots and, and professional one. And uh, 
much of the criticism came from grassroots movement towards uh, professional NGOs for being uh, uh, non-authentic, for depoliticizing their struggles and so on. But also what, uh, what happened uh, is that uh, um, uh, critical potential of, uh, of uh, civil society organization was also uh, to a certain extent declining uh, uh, since uh, uh, the, the support from the EU came. Uh, and one of the consequences uh, also is that uh, although EU stimulated mechanisms of citizen participation in decision-making processes, these mechanisms were actually not developed. Uh, so we have unresponsive institutions to citizens' demands, which are leading to the uh, street politics and radicalization of environmental protests. And uh, of course, finally, uh, one of the consequences that came with EU conditionality is that uh, environmental issues are are very much put as some kind of administrative issue, something that has to be overcome uh, in the process of EU accession and uh, that is failing to resonate among citizens and that is being cut off from the real problems of the people. So as you can see, this relationship between the EU and the process of uh, accession uh, and development of env environmental movement is uh, uh, contradictory. Uh, this development of movement in Serbia was to a large, list, to a large extent stimulated by the activities of grass mo grassroots movements. But what is also interesting that uh, the biggest two, two environmental uh, initiatives in Serbia against hydropower plants and against lithium mining are actually connected precisely with implementation of the European green policies. And of course, it should be said that uh, these two uh, paths or those, these two streams are not really exhausting the whole entire realm of green activism in Serbia because another stream of activism is also active and that, that are protests against air pollution. And uh, here we are coming to another interesting uh, situation because Serbia is still using a lot of fossil fuels and there is a uh, huge uh, air pollution in, in, in Serbia. So uh, of course, as you said, something has to be done. Some green policies has to be implemented. Uh, but uh, when they uh, are implementing in such situation, they're uh, creating new challenge, environmental challenges. So we have uh, three streams of environmental movement in Serbia against air pollution, against small hydropower plants, and against Rio Tinto, which are actually quite contradictory in their nature because one were caused by the uh, use of fossil fuels, and they're calling for the need, they're ca they're I I calling for the use of uh, of green energy. But when you uh, use green energy or when you produce green energy, you're forming another form, another another uh, another level of environmental hazards, and which is provoking another stream of environmental movement and discontent. So I will stop here because I had something to say about pathways of transnationalization of this movement, but maybe if we have time, I can uh, talk about it later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yelena. There are already questions for you in the chat, but. Um, I'll continue uh, with our last speaker before we enter the discussion, um, who, who is Lucy Grail, uh, anthropologist by training, uh, who is a member of the entire Italian environmental organization ASUD since 2008, where she works as project manager, researcher and trainer. Um, she's, Lucy is also president of uh, CDCA, the Documentation Center on Environmental Conflicts. Um, as an environmental and climate activist, uh, Lucy coordinates the Giudizio Universale campaign, Universal Judgment campaign, this is a, my personal translation, promoting the climate litigation against the Italian state for insufficiency um, of the cli state climate measures uh, in, in, that presented in court in June 2021. Um, Lucy, the floor is yours. Can you hear us? Yes, I understand that you are working. Yeah, on sorry, the I'm mute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I managed okay. to sharing screen. Thank you very much, okay. Guisa. Uh, and thanks to uh, the previous presenters. It was very interesting. Uh, I learned uh, a lot uh, from your presentation. Um, I will I will go uh, quickly. I think we are running a bit out of time, so I will go straight to the point. Uh, as Luisa presented, um, I will try to talk to you about about uh, the campaign we have developed and the legal uh, action we have developed to try to push 
uh, in Italy for more ambitious uh, climate mitigation action. Um, it's interesting to see the connection uh, with uh, with countries from the Western Bar Balkans that you know are uh, understanding how entering the EU would probably change uh, on uh, environmental policies while we are historical uh, European countries and we are still very, very bad uh, with environmental policies in terms of their implementation and their effectiveness, uh, in particular when we look into climate change. Um, we have decided as an organization to, to start, we're working in a field of environment and climate justice for 20 years now. And uh, what brought us to try to, to get to legal action was uh, on one hand, because there, there's a clear lack of effectiveness of institutional participation in the field of climate policy, in general, in environmental policies. Uh, we have participated at many national uh, solicitation for participation on national plan on energy and climate. And it was clear that uh, our views were not taken into account. Um, so for us, going to justice was a way to put more weight and to address some power imbalance that there is uh, when you're doing advocacy on environmental and climate justice. This is something that reinforced your position and uh, your capacity to do advocacy. And it was also for us a way to engage uh, grassroots and activists act active in the country uh, in various fields, uh, in handling fossil fuels, for example, in general uh, groups that were opposing environmental degradation, um, activists and organization working in climate justice, but also human rights. So it was also a way to put all these uh, persons, all these groups all together with a common uh, fight to defend, let's say, this big higher issue that we have with climate change coming up and the fact that our country was doing a little. Um, as soon as an organization came to this kind of, of reflection, um, and came to climate litigation in, in the specifics, first because we had in the time working a lot in terms of participative research at looking how legal tools uh, were fundamental in the framework of environmental conflict. So what, what you have been uh, telling us all about during this um, during this webinar, so groups or communities that oppose to um, projects or activities that are limiting or that are da damaging the natural resources that they need. So we are always looked at how legal tools could support communities in their request for environmental justice and how this is true for environmental justice. This is also true uh, in climate justice. Um, around 2015, also with the Paris Agreement, there have been many cases of climate litigation that were building up and getting more and more visibility and getting connection with key players, in particular in, in Europe. Uh, I think in particular of uh, the Urgenda uh, Organization Foundation in the Netherlands, as well as Notre Ferratus in France, were definitely key in us deciding to see how we could replicate in our country the same kind of action in, in, in order to press under uh, our state to do more for, uh, for the climate. Um, we believe that uh, legal actions, they cannot exist uh, disconnected from the rest. They are the need of the type of action and they feed of the type of action. Uh, they are key sectors. Of course, social, social mobilization are key. Advocacy, as I mentioned before, they are fundamental. We need advocacy when you when you have climate action, when you have legal action and, and vice versa. It's fundamental connection also with the research sector, and I will show you why also in our specific cases. And it's fundamental talking about media attention. So campaigning is a wonderful tool to get media attention. Campaigning through a legal action is definitely helping out to bring big question that might not arise in uh, in the public debate, for example, like the liabilities of a state regarding climate change. Um, to give you a bit some ideas, um, as I said, we worked, uh, historically speaking, a lot on um, environmental conflict. So as soon as an organization has been working its whole life with local communities, with grassroots local committees that were engaged in the defense of their environment, um, going into a campaign around the legal action was important for us to gather all the local actors and the grassroots that we have worked with in the years to become part of this campaign. Part of the campaign also because the legal action might not be able to include them all because of uh, legal issues of having, a, um, let's say, just a legal entity uh, to be represented. And it was a way also to 
have a capillar action throughout the territory. So throughout the country, the campaign help us out to go city by city, region by region, meeting people and also engaging groups and individuals to be part of the campaign on one hand and to be, when possible, also part of the legal action. So we launched the campaign in 2019. During two years, we have been campaigning all around the territory and we have been developing the legal strategy that we presented in June 2021. And we have enlarged the campaign to get more supporters signing a petition in support of the legal action that represent more or less uh, 20,000 people uh, in Italy. Uh, we managed like this to get 203 plaintiffs in our legal action. We are not a class action country, so it's not really easy in a procedural way to get so many people, but we choose to do that. To get uh, groups, so we have 24 associations. To get adults, we have 162 adults and also 17 minors, because the question of new and future generation are fundamental in climate justice in general, and it's also a key aspect of our uh, legal action. And they represent people living in uh, the 17 regions, over 20 regions in the country. So it's also a representation of the people living in Italy. Uh, will they be Italian or foreigners? Um, the legal action in very briefly, uh, our objective is to ask uh, the Civil Court of Rome uh, to amend a ruling that would impose the adoption of a state decision to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we are in a mitigation a reduction of emission reduction uh, in order to ensure climate stability for the entire uh, Italian territory, but also guaranteeing the protection of human rights for the present and future generation, as I said before, in accordance with the constitutional duty of solidarity that we have in Italy, but also the international duty of fairness among states. And I will briefly talk about that because it does not regard just Italy, it regards also the historical responsibility that the country has in terms of climate change. Uh, we had had to work with science. We have mobilized researchers from climate analytics uh, in order to have them to review the validity of the policies and the plan that our country have been built in, built in terms of uh, climate change and climate mitigation to see uh, and evaluate the quantity of emission reduction that could lead to and also the effective achievement of international solidarity and equity between states. And this is what is often referred to as fair share, so that some countries has historical responsibility for which they should reduce more their emission than other countries. Uh, very briefly, what are the key message of the campaign, but also of the legal action, because they are basically saying the same thing. Uh, first, we start from the uh, fact that the state is fully aware of the seriousness of the climate emergency for a very, very long time that the policies in place are totally inadequate and insufficient, given the, the, state, uh, the state of the art and the time that has passed, that Italy is a very uh, vulnerable uh, country in regard to climate impacts, in particular in terms of the fatalities that we have in our country because of climate change, and because not acting enough for climate change is a failure, uh, it results in a violation of citizens' fundamental human rights. So this is what we call uh, the climate litigation uh, related to human rights. So we are stating the fact that for a state not to do enough uh, for climate change is a violation of the human rights of the people living uh, on the territory. Uh, very briefly on the inadequacy of the climate policies in Italy, to give you a few numbers that can speak more clearly, um, what climate analytics did for us is to calculate how much the current policies, that mean the policies in place today in our country, would lead in terms uh, of uh, emission reduction, and we would arrive to 26% of emission reduction by 2030, so we are way uh, beyond the 55% uh, that we have now at the European level. Uh, if we, if they look at uh, the plans we had at the time, for example, the National Integrated Energy and Climate Plan, uh, we would get to 36% emission reduction. More updated uh, plans lead to 42% emission reduction. We are very, very far beyond uh, the EU target at the moment, which is in itself quite insufficient. If you look, for example, at UNEP recommendation of 65% or other type of uh, calculation. As it was important for us to look at uh, the historical responsibility of the country, but also uh, its cap financial capacity and technological capacity, um, what climate analytics did is to calculate a target based on fair share 
So taking into account equity principles that are at the core of the, of the Paris Agreement and in general international climate policies, and the calculating using all the methodologies existing today that Italy should, if they would implement the Paris Agreement and the equity principle, reduce their emission by 92% by 2030. So if it's clearly a target that domestically speaking, it's quite uh, impossible to, to realize with the time being, uh, this is something that should be a target also indicating the help that the country should provide to other countries that does not have the same level of financial and uh, technological capacity as we do. Very briefly, some reference yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of the obligation that we have as a country in Europe. Uh, of course, the UNFCCC, of course, the Paris Agreement, but uh, the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights are a key uh, tool at European level for climate litigation. When you look in particular to the Article 2, 8 and 14, that has to do with the right to life, the respect for private and family life, and also the prohibition of discrimination, which is uh, implicated uh, into uh, when you're looking at climate change. And just to finish with what are we are asking the judge, we are asking the judge to declare that the Italian state is responsible for failing to address the climate emergency and is in violation of human rights by doing so. And we ask the judge to pronounce itself about a target of emission reduction for our country because we have no climate law in our country, which has established a national reduction target. Uh, we will have our final hearing. We are in the first instance in terms of the legal procedure. So we have the final hearing in autumn. We expect to have the first uh, instance uh, sentence by the end of 2023, 2024. And it's interesting looking at the dynamics at European level of similar action to see that the Duarte case, which is a case uh, at the European Court of Human Rights against 33 states, uh, among all the European Union states, uh, that is asking the state the same thing, the Italian state the same thing as we are, and they will have uh, their next hearing also in the same um, in the same period of us. So it's interesting to see how those kind of um, regional and national legal tools can support each other and reinforce in, so in each other in order to pressure the state to do more to protect uh, people from climate change and try to inverse uh, the process. That's thank all. you very much. Um, first of all, let me thank you all for keeping the time so that we do still have 10 minutes for a round of questions um, that, of course, your speech is uh, raised. Um, and I'd like to, um, to start with uh, Amelie, uh, following the order uh, we had from the very beginning. You, your description shows the amount, the, the width of your work because you had to, to uh, uh, were able to create enormous amount of alliances, uh, including activists, um, but all at grassroots level and artists at international one, um, including private public partnerships and international media. So you clearly um, achieved to do a perfect campaign, let's say. Um, because of the uh, uh, typology of actors involved, the amount of work you did. The point, uh, the question is, um, who did support you? I mean, this requires, uh, finan in financial terms, uh, this requires a very large uh, investment of time and energy by a very large amount of actors. So um, the, uh, uh, how could you make it? Because of the, the, the means to carry out, we would all like to do a lot of things that we cannot do because we are not in the position to, to do it. I, I do the round of all questions and instead, um, and then you can uh, decide to answer what you prefer. As for our um, member of parliament, uh, Thomas Waits, uh, my question would be, uh, to what extent uh, the fact that we are discussing um, wild Balkans, Pristine River is what really made the difference. Because somehow we know that um, there is an exotic approach to the Balkans when we like them. Um, of course, when we don't like them, instead, we only speak about negative uh, problems. But somehow, would we be able to mobilize in transnationally or internationally for the Balkans when it is a question of um, ordinary uh, rivers, like the, the non -pre precisely ordinary, but large and very polluted Danube River uh, that um, when it enters uh, uh, Serbia is relatively clean after having been um, purified somehow in, in Romania, but then it becomes very, very uh, um, uh, polluted when it 
gets, gets out. So the question is, are we dealing with the wild imagination for the Balkans and therefore we can act, but then when it is um, more ordinary situations, then we wouldn't be able to create such a, um, a large uh, mobilization. Then I go for Yelena. Um, we already have a question for you from the chat. Uh, um, uh, Tara Ariel uh, Sukic uh, asked, uh, would like to know how uh, or on which level should the European Union proceed to force the sufficient implementation of nature legislation in Serbia? And I add to this question, um, uh, uh, you know, how much, uh, how important um, do you think, uh, well, I, I risk to ask a question that uh, you had not, did not have time to explain. So please take the time to explain uh, the piece you didn't add at the very end uh, regarding the transnationalization of the Serbian movement. And finally, um, for Lucy, um, I'd like to ask you, um, you uh, seem to discuss when you talk about legal actions um, on something that you, during our Trapoco project we described as vertical transnationalism, basically using uh, laws and provisions from um, the European Union uh, or in general international organizations, um, but you didn't mention any horizontal um, uh, mobilization, meaning solidarity activity, including people that are not Italian or don't live in Italy. Um, do you have um, also, did you rely, and you, you didn't have the time to mention, uh, to any uh, transnational uh, um, um, horizontal uh, dynamic as well? So uh, in order to have all of us uh, giving an answer, <laughs> all of you giving an answer, um, I'll start with um, Amelie, if you better, uh, to, to respond, please. Yeah, thank you, Luisa. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, we've had, um, I mean, I think we're, we were lucky to have like a mosaic of, let's say, um, financial supporters um, throughout the campaign. And there was no, no point in time where we relied on just one uh, donor. Um, so there were different foundations. Um, Patagonia as a brand also um, provided small grants um, uh, and, and continues to do so. Um, that we, had, uh, we were lucky to have for uh, several years a very generous um, sponsorship from a Swiss foundation called Mara Foundation who were interested in promoting and protecting ecosystems across the Mediterranean. And unfortunately, they, their support was always programmed to end at a certain time, and that was last year. So that's gone now, um, and that of course, um, yeah, restricts the le level of um, activity, the amount of activities we can carry on now. But there's still um, foundations like Manfred Hermsen Foundation and others that um, continue to support the campaign. Thank you so much. Because I guess you also um, know how important it is to have uh, some kind of international support because it takes a lot of energy and time to to be able to to proceed. I mean, it was not um, anyway. Um, uh, as for uh, Thomas Wade. Uh, yes, um, there is there is a tension, especially on the Danube, because Danube is coming from EU countries and then again uh, flowing through EU countries. And especially, I mean, the, the Belgrade case uh, is one of the main issues where you have massive pollution. But there, I mean, you have seen in the networking uh, um, uh, sheet that we have seen earlier from, from Amelie, you've seen uh, um, Bravna Navoda, so this uh, Serbian organization. Uh, they would be the best interlocutors to to talk about how how you how you put pressure on the Serbian government uh, to look into pollution of the Danube River. But it is very much related to the let's say real will of a country to access the European Union. Uh, so so we it's it's a bit easier with countries that that clearly are on a path uh, like Montenegro as an example, yeah, with, with Salina Ulcin as an example, or or Lake Skadar uh, to do some protection measures uh, or or to talk about. These or or when, when we look into Albania, but also North Mas North Macedonia, uh, Brespa Lake, Ohrid Lake, as an as an example, Mavro National Park. This is all topics we can talk about, uh, um, and and uh, we can put pressure. And there's openness also by at least parts of the authorities uh, to look into these cases. 
it's getting more difficult with a country like Serbia, where it's unclear to us whether uh, uh, not the population, but the government as such really wants to join the European Union. Uh, that's very unclear. I mean, in fact, the accession talks uh, there's no progress, even though sometimes EU politicians pretend there would be some, but I can tell you it's, it, there's no progress. It's rather going backwards. And, and so uh, let's say uh, you, you can't work with the carrot, you know, I mean, um, so so the carrot of EU accession, the carrot of additional finances. Yeah. Um, um, so you need the will of a country to move towards European standards, because that's what we're actually talking about. Uh, European standards of, of nature protection, but also European standards of water quality, water framework, as an example, which would apply uh, uh, to the Danube. So uh, it is possible to talk about these topics, but it depends very much on the country's um, yeah, um, uh, will or, or, or interest, amount of interest to come closer to the, towards the European Union. And that also defines sometimes the, the, diffic the, the difficult or the difference in approach. Uh, just to mention Bosnia Herzegovina, there what we face is just an institutional crisis, uh, uh, big, big, uh, um, uh, well, divisions and, and, and between the different parts of the country. So basically a national government that is not really able to implement uh, national policies uh, on, on the whole territory. So there we are really facing institutional weakness uh, um, uh, as in, in our cooperation partners, which makes it very difficult to really have an impact on legislation or, ju or ju juridication. Thank you. Yelena. Thank you very much. I will try to merge my answers to those two questions and to say, well, I'm not sure what would be the most effective way to uh, put pressure on Serbian government in terms of uh, environmental legislation, because uh, most of the legislation is there, but uh, control mechanisms are not put in place. So we have this, uh, I was uh, listening, to, listening to your presentations and much of this was was related, much of this activism was related to legal, legal, legal actions. But uh, uh, in Serbia, you cannot do that because you have uh, ineffective judiciary system, ineffective courts. You cannot pursue these kind of actions in, in this kind of environment. So you can, what you can do is to uh, put claims on international level and then to have international pressure, international court putting pressure on, on national on national level. Uh, what is also interesting that, uh, uh, and that is uh, what I wanted to uh, somehow merge with your question on the levels of transnationalization. Uh, in Serbia, environmental issues at one point became one of the key political issues. So as I said, we had two uh, big environmental initiatives that were success stories, uh, small hydropower plants and uh, Rio Tinto. But why did they, uh, why they were so successful? successful? Because they uh, managed to merge with the, the structures which were already existing and put the structure against democratic backsliding. So uh, they actually, we have this kind of merging of environmental issue with the anti-government sentiment and anti-government protests. And why uh, environmental issues were so successful because they were actually, you know, uh, environment is everybody's problem. So everybody, it, it has this kind of power to uh, bypass ideological cleavages and to mobilize both uh, people who are coming from the left, from the right, from the center, and also those who are uh, not politically uh, really active. So they managed to put, uh, these projects managed to put environmental issue as one of the key political issues. So the success came from these massive protests on the streets and pressure which was coming from the street, not from the legal actions or from external pressures, but from this kind of uh, pressure which was really evident on the streets and it, it was something that you can just, you know, touch uh, as, as a pressure. So that is, that is, uh, I would say that that is uh, the ceiling of the pressure you can put on Serbian government. Why? Because uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, whether you can do actions on local or national level. We have, uh, I mentioned the gene factory and high steel factory, which are Chinese operated factories in Serbia. You really don't know what is happening there because there is no control mechanism. So we are talking about some kind of political deals uh, and you can, you know, put some claims over the, uh, what can be done, but you really don't, there is kind of a, a, a real the, on which you cannot really influence. So that's... thank you very much, Elena. Lucy, you are the last one, but not the least important. I will be, I'll try to be very quick. Uh, two things. Uh, first, on the legal action itself, as I, as I tried to mention briefly, 
uh, this is not just Italian people that are plaintiffs to the action. Uh, it regards all people living in Italy and among the plaintiffs, there are non-Italian people as I am, but there are other people as well. So this is the first level of, of let's say, inclusion. Looking at more the transnational dynamics of uh, I wouldn't, uh, climate justice movement, of course, is a very transnational movement as the environmental movement is. Um, but if you look in a specific case on climate litigation actors, uh, the first thing to note is that it's quite a recent movement in terms of type of action. So maybe the big explosion was around 2015. So it's something new. So of course, this coordination among groups takes time. But it's also, I think, a very um, a proactive and connected uh, world. So as I mentioned, we've been working with Urgenda, with Notre Affaire à tous. There is a big network of uh, litigators that communicate among themselves. Small campaigns are starting to be developed around COPs, for example, to have uh, common demands toward decision makers regarding uh, the ambition of target emission reduction, for example. And little by little, uh, things are developing. There are actors, uh, big actors among climate litigators that are trying also to support the development of climate litigation in other countries. So let's say that it's kind of a, of a very a uh, transnational uh, environment that tries to foster um, the positive contamination of this kind of practice in, in very various and different kind of countries. Uh, I, I would say it's a very generous movement also in terms of support. What we try to do here from our little uh, capacity is uh, try to bring information regarding all the climate litigation in Europe and around the world. So also to show that this is something that is widespread and talks to each other. What we can see though is that um, at the moment, most of the climate litigator actors are big uh, national NGOs, environmental NGOs. And in this panorama, we are one of the, the, I don't know if I can say the only one, but we are one of the few that are brought up by small organization or that are coordinating from a grassroots, grassroots perspective and not from a big NGO perspective, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the time is, uh, um, we have run out of time, so, I don't think we can leave many more time for questions unless any of you want to address each other and then write it on the chat. And um, as for me, I would conclude by saying that um, it's very clear that when we talk about the Balkans, the enlargement uh, process uh, could or is central in many ways, but at the same time for years it was in deep crisis, so it could really not exert the type of pressure it was necessary. And of course local government uh, desire to um, uh, abide by this process was also very important. But at the same time we know that social movements um, are fundamental to challenge uh, um, countries or governments that don't want to um, be sufficiently democratic or they don't want to advance in the enlargement process in general unless um, because they are fundamental for to push democracy forward or um, to ensure that democracy doesn't worsen um, too much. The problem is that the European Union is often afraid uh, of social movements so there is not necessarily a very easy dynamic between social movement and institutions and on the other side, um, very often social movements don't see European Union as a one thing, single thing that is seen uh, as somehow partner with um, uh, transnational corporations, international corporations that only want to exploit uh, uh, their own countries. So uh, there should be a trust, uh, build, a tr building trust uh, with um, a civil society uh, and social movement organization where the European Union is clearly identified not as one little thing or big thing but in, in a, a big amount of actors that include uh, uh, the parliament but also agencies tribunals and also a lot of other uh, social movements because of course in order to have um, um, all these elements coming in by uh, international media involved, firms ready to support civil society initiatives, or um, um, uh, in general, um, scientists, activists, sport people, as in the Biosa experience, uh, were central. All this requires uh, an idea of Europe that is um, multifaceted and uh, with plenty of, of actors. When we then conclude thinking about the Italian example where uh, this new um, frontier of legal 
um, activism is um, described, we found it in many other um, fields, not only in environmental activism. It's indeed the new frontier of NGOs. And at the same time, it's true that uh, you have to have a lot of skills and force in order to undertake such uh, very complicated uh, uh, things uh, that are litigation. Um, so somehow the Italian civil society requires uh, uh, to step up its level of uh, NGOs in order to, uh, to be uh, stronger and at the same time maintain this very strong uh, grassroots connection that instead is necessary to, to be um, successful um, and uh, remain um, connected with uh, social dynamics. Um, in general, I think we should conclude with the idea that, that there are positive cases. We are not very, um, um, uh, very, very often. It doesn't happen very often to have positive examples. So we should take um, the Vios um, uh, work, uh, these ten years of experience, as a very positive example. Remembering how long does it takes, how many actors should be involved, how important it is transnational connections in order to make sure that everyone who is responsible, who has a share in responsibility is involved um, one way or another. In general, I really thank you all for having been here and, all, and everybody who listened to us will try to give large this diffusion of this webinar anyway uh, in the next weeks to come. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.